Welcome to Premium Builds. I'm John, and in this video we're going to show you how to build your own PC. We know that the thought of building a computer from components can seem daunting, but it needn't be. In this video we'll cover the entire process from start to finish. We're going to cover installing both AMD and Intel CPUs, and we'll show you loads of tips and tricks. By the end of this video, you'll know everything you need to build your own PC. First, let's jump in and familiarise ourselves with some general advice about parts. Before you build, you will need to buy the component parts. Rather than show you how to build a specific PC, we've kept this video general. Everything we show you is relevant to every PC, and there really isn't much difference between them until you start looking at specialist builds. A basic parts list consists of a processor, compatible motherboard, memory, and a storage device. We strongly recommend a solid state drive as they're now affordable in large capacities and make a huge difference to the day-to-day -day performance of your PC. If you're buying an Intel K-series CPU, or want better or quieter cooling, you'll need a CPU cooler too. In most situations you'll also need a graphics card, and if you're looking to build a gaming PC, you'll want to bias your spend towards this. Finally, you'll need a case and a power supply. With these six basic components you'll have everything you need to build a PC. The CPU cooler comes with thermal paste, the motherboard comes with a backplate, some hard drive cables, and basic accessories. Your power supply will come with the internal cables you need to wire up the PC, whilst the case itself usually includes at least one fan, and some accessories and mounting hardware. You might want to add some fans to your build to keep temperatures down. In this build I'll be replacing the stock fan with a Corsair 120mm fan, and adding two 140mm fans to the front to act as intakes. This common setup ensures the case gets plenty of airflow. You can head over to premiumbuilds.com for up-to-date guides on the best builds at any price and for every purpose. If you use one of our parts selections, you can be sure that you're getting a well-optimised system that's fully compatible. But the beauty of building your own PC is you can tailor it to your own needs and wishes. With the parts in hand, let's look at the tools you'll need to complete the job. You'll definitely need a medium-sized crosshead screwdriver, and one with a magnetic tip is super useful to help you position screws. A smaller crosshead screwdriver is necessary if you're installing an M.2 drive. In this build you'll see me using a 5mm socket to fit the motherboard standoffs, but a pair of pliers will do in a pinch. There are some additional accessories you might use to tidy up your build. Cable ties are useful to tidy up your cable runs and keep things neat. Most cases or power supplies come with a few, but having some more around is a good idea. You can also get velcro straps to deal with the bigger cables, and these are reusable. Thermal paste isn't essential, but for $5 it's handy to have it around. You can use it to slightly improve CPU temperatures over stock paste, or reapply it if you remove and refit the cooler for any reason. Finally, there will be some accessories and hardware with your case, so make sure that you've got that, and read the manual to find out which bolts and accessories you're going to use for each part. I've got a couple of quick tips about cable management. First, you can use a cable tie backwards to prevent it locking shut. This means you can use them to hold cables out of the way as you build, and still open them to add more cables to a bundle. You can leave them like that, or else reverse them and ratchet them shut once you're happy with your cabling. Finally, don't be tempted to use the twist ties that come with some of the components. They have a wire core in them that can be exposed at the ends or if the installation gets stripped. This presents a short circuit hazard inside your PC, and it could damage your components, so don't use them. Let's move on to the build process. There's no set order to how you build a PC, but it certainly makes sense to approach it methodically, and start with the case and motherboard. These two components come with the bulk of accessories you'll need to build your computer, so open them up and take a look at them before you get started. Both will have instruction manuals, and it's a great idea to familiarise yourself with them. There are some diagrams in the motherboard manual here that are essential to wiring up the PC correctly. We'll cover that in more depth later. The case itself will come with some of the hardware you need, like additional screws and probably some cable ties, brackets and other accessories. So, grab your case and motherboard, and let's move to the first step, preparing the case itself. First, let's get the case prepared to accept the motherboard. There are only a few basic jobs to do here. We've chosen the Thermaltake Versa H17 because the design is common to a lot of cases on the market, with a PSU shroud, removable side panels, and a standard internal layout. First, you want to take both side panels off by undoing the screws or thumb screws and sliding them off. If you've got a case with a glass panel, handle it with care, as a knock to the edge of the glass could shatter it. Set the side panels aside, we'll only replace them when we finish the build. We need to check that the standoffs are in place so that the motherboard is properly supported. Compare the position of the standoffs in the motherboard tray with the standoff holes in your motherboard. Add any that are missing to the relevant spots. They just need to be nipped up, don't over tighten them. Most have a cross head to allow you to do this with a screwdriver, but mine don't so I'm using a 5mm hex socket to screw them into place. Once your standoffs are in place it's in time to install the IO backplate. 
A quick tip here is to bend the small tabs on the inside face perpendicular. This will help you fit the motherboard later. Take note of the socket layout on the motherboard to ensure that you get it the right way round, and press it into place from the inside of the case. Watch out because it has sharp edges. Higher end motherboards sometimes have this integrated into the motherboard around the I.O. panel, so you can skip this step. You may find it helpful to remove the rear fan at this point to free up workspace inside the case, so just unscrew and remove it and set it aside for now. Now's a good point to test fit the motherboard to ensure it fits and your standoffs are properly installed. Finally, with the case, it's worth taking a moment to familiarise yourself with the front panel cables and put them into place so they're not in the way later. Your case should have at least a USB 2.0 and 3.0 cable, a power switch cable and an HD audio cable. These all connect to the motherboard after we've fitted it. Place them out of the way for now. With the case prepared, it's time to build up the motherboard prior to install. This is the fun part, we're going to show you how to install a CPU, RAM and M.2 drive as well as the cooler. This will build the functional core of the PC. There are some minor differences in AMD and Intel CPU mounting systems that we'll cover. We'll show you how to mount a stock AMD cooler, but there's a lot of variation in mounting mechanisms for aftermarket CPU coolers, so make sure you follow the instructions if you're using something different. Everything else is common to any PC build, so let's get started. It's a good idea to place the motherboard on the foam it's supplied with whilst you work, so it's properly supported and you won't damage components on the rear of the board against a hard surface. This AMD AM4 CPU socket design has an array of pins on the CPU and a socket with holes to accept them. This is how you fit everything from a Ryzen 3200G APU up to the 3950X. They're all the same size and shape. Handle the CPU with care because dropping it could result in bent or broken pins. Leave it in the plastic case until you're ready to fit it and handle it carefully by the edges. Start by lifting the lever arm on the socket to 90 degrees. This moves a grid that will later clamp the pins into place. Next, take your CPU and orient it so that the small golden arrow in the corner is pointing directly away from the point where the lever arm meets the socket. You can see in that corner there's a pin missing. Correctly oriented, the CPU will drop straight into the socket and sit flush. Then lower the arm and lock it into place under the tab. That's all there is to it. Your AMD Ryzen CPU is now installed. Here's how you install the AMD stock cooler. AMD motherboards ship with two hook style retainers on the socket, which are used with Wraith Prism Cooler, which comes with the Ryzen 3700Xs or higher. If you're fitting that cooler, you don't need to modify anything here. However, the coolers that come with the Ryzen 3600 and 3600X both require you to remove the clips. This allows the cooler to screw into the back plate behind, so use your screwdriver to remove them. The cooler has thermal paste pre-applied, so you just need to fit it over the CPU socket. The retainers on this cooler are sprung screws to ensure the correct mounting pressure on the CPU. Hold the cooler in place and screw it down corner by corner. It can take a bit of force to overcome the screw spring pressure, so go carefully. Doing opposite corners in turn in a star pattern can help, and don't over tighten the screws, just bottom them out. Finally, route the fan cable neatly and plug it into the CPU fan header. It's normally close to the socket and marked CPU fan or similar, but consult your motherboard manual. Installing an Intel CPU, Intel LGA1151 or LGA1200. Intel's current CPU sockets differ from AMD in that the base of the CPU is flat, but the socket itself has a number of delicate leaf springs that make contact with the pads on it. There are slight variations between CPU generations to prevent you fitting an incompatible CPU, but the process is the same. There's a plastic cover on the CPU socket to protect it, and you can leave it in place until it pops off when you install the CPU. The inside of the socket is extremely delicate, so don't touch. Lift the lever to expose the socket beneath. The CPU shape is keyed to the socket, so it's impossible to fit the wrong way around. Look for the notches on the CPU and line them up with the tabs in the socket. Make sure it sits flush in the socket, then lower the lever. The plastic guard pops off, and that's your CPU installed. Installing RAM. With the CPU and cooler installed, it's time to move on to the RAM. Ensure that you're using the correct two slots if you have a two-stick kit. If you use the wrong slots, it won't work in dual-channel mode, slowing your system down. The motherboard itself may be marked, or the manual will tell you. It's usually the second and fourth slots counting away from the CPU, but that's not guaranteed. Unclip the retaining clips, and orient the RAM so that the notch aligns with the tab in the socket. You can't fit it the wrong way around. Then, push it straight down into the socket until the clips close themselves and the RAM seats home. This is straightforward, but it might take a bit more force than you're expecting. Some RAM sockets have a clip only on one side, 
so insert the ram on the non-clip end first, then push it down. Repeat for both sticks. Installing an M.2 drive. If you're installing an M.2 drive, now's the time to do that too. They're often obscured by the GPU once that's in. It's easier to work outside the case as it's a fiddly job. Don't remove any stickers from the drive, they're metallicized and act as heat spreaders. Identify which slot you want to use. Normally the one closest to the CPU is ideal for a primary drive, but check your manual. Then ensure that the standoff is in the correct location. M.2 SSDs come in different lengths, 40, 80 or 110 mm, denoted by the last digits of their form factor name. 80 mm is becoming the standard, but line up the drive to check. Ensure the standoff is securely screwed down, but don't over tighten it. Installing the drive is as simple as pushing the connector into the slot with the drive at an angle, then pushing it down so the tail end sits flush with the standoff. Use the world's smallest screw to hold it into place, and you're done. If you have an M.2 heatsink, refit them now. Mounting the board into the case. With the CPU, cooler, RAM and any M.2 drives in place, it's time to mount the board into the case. Lie the case on its back and ensure any cables are tucked out of the way so they don't get trapped. Place the motherboard into position by tucking the I.O. panel into place first, then lowering the back of the board onto the standoffs. Ensure the I.O. plate lines up neatly. You might have to help some of the spring tabs over the socket housings so they don't obscure the ports themselves. When it's in place, you'll see that every standoff is visible through the motherboard holes. Use your magnetic tip screwdriver to carefully screw down each of the standoff mount points. These just need to be nipped up tight. Don't over tighten. Once all your screws are in, that's the motherboard installed. Now the motherboard is in place, it's a good opportunity to connect the wires we have already, before the case gets cluttered with additional wiring. Consult your manual for exact locations of each of the cable headers, and route the cables so that they enter the main case compartment close to the location where you're going to plug them in. Fit your HD audio and USB plugs. Then tackle the case switch and LED plugs. These are the most fiddly, so you'll need to find the layout diagram for the header that you connect them to. You need to get positive and negative the right way around for power and hard disk LEDs, but the switches don't matter and can be connected either way. Then tackle your fans if they're installed. Route the cable neatly to the closest fan header and retain it with cable ties for now. If you have more fans than fan headers, you may need some fan splitters. You can tidy these cables in the rear of the case behind the motherboard tray. Now is a good opportunity to fit the SATA cable if you're using a SATA drive and route it towards the 2.5 inch mount location. Installing the power supply. This is where things can get a little confusing, so you'll need to keep tabs on what cables go where. First, start by locating and identifying the cables you'll need and adding them to the power supply if required. Modular PSUs will need you to add all the cables. Semi-modular power supplies will need you to add a PCIe and SATA power cable or two. Add enough PCIe cables to fully populate the power sockets on your graphics card. You'll need a SATA power cable if you're using a SATA drive, and some accessories like liquid cooler pumps or RGB systems use them too. Note that the PSU cables are keyed with a combination of square and rounded plastic shapes on the pins. You can't fit them in the wrong place, so if something isn't fitting easily, stop and check you have it right. You must only use the PSU cables supplied with your power supply, because the pinouts aren't standard. If you swap cables between power supplies, you could kill your components. Once you've added the cables, let's get the power supply fitted. Orient the power supply so that the fan is facing the vent in the bottom of the case. Slide the PSU into the case and position it so the screw holes line up at the rear. Insert the screws to hold it into place. Some case designs require you to mount a plate to the power supply and then install it from the rear and screw it into place. Route the cables towards their destination and pass them through from the back to the front of the case close to their socket locations. Now it's time to connect the cables to the motherboard. Connect the 8-pin EPS cable for CPU power, then the 24-pin ATX connector. Note that this plug is sometimes split with a separate 4-pin section that can be fiddly to fit. Once fitted, work the cables back towards the power supply to tidy them up and hold them in place with straps or cable ties. Feed the PCIe cables up through a lower hole towards the GPU location on the front side. We'll connect them to the GPU later. 
With the power supply fitted and connected, tidy the cables into a bundle and use cable ties to hold them together. The front of the power supply shroud is a useful place to hide them. You could also put additional unused modular cables here so that they don't get lost for future use. Installing a SATA drive. If you've got either a 2.5 inch SSD or a 3.5 inch hard disk, now is the time to wire it up and install it. Your case will have some mounting hardware and brackets, so decide where you want it and route the SATA data cable from the motherboard and the SATA power cable from the power supply towards that location. Plug them both into the drives and use the screws supplied to mount the drive to its bracket or the case. The SATA plugs are keyed with an L shape so they can't be fitted incorrectly. That's all it takes. Once it's mounted, again, tidy the cables away behind the scenes. Now is the time to fit fans. Do this by screwing them in from the outside with the coarse through spread supplied with the fans. Front intake fans will require you to remove the front panel of the case. The fans connect to the headers on the motherboard like the CPU fan did, and there's a small plastic tab to locate a 3-pin fan onto the 4-pin header. Double check all connections as you go, and ensure nothing is fouling any fans. Fans draw air in through the open face and push it out back past the motor bracket. Most also have an arrow showing the rotation direction and airflow direction, so use those to help you install them the right way around. With all the cables in place, it's a good opportunity to spend some time tidying up. Pull each cable neatly to the rear of the case and use straps to bundle them up. There are tie-down points in the case to help you. Installing the GPU. The last major component to fit is the graphics card and the process is simple. Open the PCIe slot catch by pressing it towards the motherboard. Remove the right number of PCIe slot covers for the size of the GPU backplate and retain the screws. On cheaper cases, these may be thin metal tabs that need to be broken away. Remove the PCIe connector cover from the GPU. The top slot is the x16 PCIe slot and it's the one you should use for your GPU. Push the GPU directly in, locating the tab at the rear between the motherboard and the case backplate. The PCIe slot clip will close itself when the GPU is properly installed. Use the screws you took out of the case to secure the GPU bracket back into the case. Finally, route the PCIe cables to the GPU and make sure they're fully inserted. Every plug needs to be fully populated, with more powerful GPUs having more sockets. An 8-pin uses the 6 and 2-pin sections paired up, whilst a 6-pin socket can just leave the 2-pin section hanging free. If you have any other PCIe add-in cards, like a Wi-Fi or capture card, now's the time to add those too. They install in exactly the same way. Wiring up the PC. Connect the monitor cable to the GPU, and not a motherboard port unless you're using an AMD APU or Intel integrated graphics. Plug in the power supply and monitor and switch them on, remembering to flip the switch on the power supply. You can do your future self a favour here and blank off the motherboard video outputs with the GPU blanking plugs. This will remind you in future where to correctly connect the monitor if you ever have to set the PC up again. Then it's the moment of truth. Press the case power button. With a bit of luck, your system will boot and show you the BIOS screen. If not, don't worry, it's most likely something simple, so follow our troubleshooting guide to double check everything. Now the PC is working, turn the power off and replace the side panels. And then it's time to begin initial setup and installing your operating system. We'll cover that in a future video. I hope you've enjoyed this build video and found it informative, and I really hope you've now got the confidence that you can go ahead and build your own PC. It really is the best way to get the computer you need at the price you want to pay. Make sure you subscribe to get the latest parts advice, reviews and build guides, and make sure to check us out at premiumbuilds.com.